thank you for joining us um, and for being part of this session. We are getting a little bit of a late start. Um, it's really like 9.20 in the morning, so we have plenty of time, right? Yeah. yeah. We're good. Um, thank you so much for coming to the Environmental Stewardship and Energy Conservation Panel. My name is Edith Bakra, and I'm Environment Director for the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus. Uh, we're a membership organization of 275 municipalities in the greater Chicago region. It has been a real pleasure to be part of the NIU CGS celebration today. This is really my first time working closely with the Center for Government Studies, and I have to say I'm very impressed uh, with the speakers and the participation, and I certainly hope that my panel uh, will, will sort of meet the bar um, and exceed it. So it's really a pleasure to be included um, in this terrific event. Um, I uh, will be I'm the Environment Director, and I will be talking about uh, regional issues. I'll start out with that, and I'm very pleased to uh, bring the panel up for presentation. Um, so the environmental uh, sustainability and stewardship, I'll talk about that, kind of setting it in context before I move into what that means at the local level um, and what we as local governments can do and are doing. Well, I'll be, do that by introducing the Greatest Region Compact. Then I'll turn it over to uh, the mayors and to Audrey Peterson, our village manager who's with us today, and they'll give you an introduction to their communities and then talk about the, uh, their perspective on sustainability and some of the highlights of the work that they're doing in their communities. And then I'll begin by asking them questions to spark some discussion, and we'll certainly invite your participation and uh, questions after that. So uh, to start with, um, definition of sustainability. So that we talk about environmental stewardship, and in, uh, it really, for environmental stewardship to be successful, really at any level, uh, it cannot be divorced from the interests of society uh, and from economic concerns. So true sustainability is really considered to be built on this tripod of people, planet, and profit is one way to put it, or an economy, environment, and society. The definition for sustainability comes from the UN, something called the Brundtland Commission, and defined as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And for local governments, and uh, uh, here's kind of a timeline of the programs and our evolution over time, but we serve so many municipalities, so our, our program started with environmental focus. And most municipalities have, have had a history of environmental programs, particularly related to recycling and solid waste reduction. We at the regional level had a program called Clean Air Counts focused on air quality, and we introduced uh, an environmental program called the Greenest Region Compact, the original one. But when we did a, a, a remake of that program and created something called the GRC2, uh, which is now what we're working on here, we really shifted towards sustainability, that broader definition of it, because um, it's built on what municipalities want to do, and it includes very strongly people and uh, economic concerns. And then now we're uh, facing a climate crisis, and the Mayor's Caucus um, is shifting to accelerate our actions and really focus on what we can do with the tools that we have and the strengths that we have to kind of sharpen our environmental and sustainability efforts um, to also have an impact on our, uh, the, the survival of our communities and well-being um, of the planet. So now this is kind of the overview, you know, putting this in perspective with national politics and global concerns. So, um, and, and I'll come back to energy efficiency, that's part of our title here, but 70% of all greenhouse gas emissions come from the power sector, the generation of, of energy, and that's a real important area for, uh, to target. So at the federal level, um, the EPA proposed something called the Clean Power Plan under the Obama administration. And that was to, to focus on reducing emissions from the power sector. But fast forward, that was not successful, as you can uh, imagine with the change in administration. Then globally, there was a step up uh, for climate commitments through the Paris Accord. Um, and every country, with the exception of two, in the, well, at least we signed on to it, but then um, rather publicly, uh, Trump announced a intent to withdraw once he took office. And then just this past week, he's taken action uh, to formalize the, uh, the withdrawal from the Climate Paris Accord, which sets targets. And there was some reaction. So um, up in the upper right corner, the, across different sectors, the shift uh, came from federal focus, federal lead leadership on climate and sustainability, and it came down to what they call the, the global climate language, subnational level. So businesses stepped up. There was a campaign called We're Still In, 
And at the local level, um, and national, this was actually a bi-national level, uh, there was a convening of mayors. And so mayors on the panel here will talk about their involvement in some of the climate initiatives um, nationally and globally. But Mayor Rahm Emanuel hosted something called the North, North American Climate Summit. We had some of our uh, mayors represented in taking that commitment um, to step up on climate. And since then, we've seen more public outcry. We have new leadership in Congress um, proposing an aspirational proposal called the Green New Deal, which really looked at the, uh, the clean energy and the climate concerns in the lens of sustainability with a strong focus on jobs and economic development. That's still out there. Um, lots of public concern now being led by our um, very charming and visionary youth. Uh, the climate strikes, we've had climate marches, climate strikes now, and then if you haven't met her yet, that's Greta Thunberg, um, who really sparked the, the global movement on climate strikes. Well, at the global level, it's really scary, um, and there's a lot of noise. We still, you know, at a local level, what, uh, what is within our power to do something about this? How do we address it? How do we fit in? And how do we answer constituent concerns? And we'll, we'll definitely rely on the panel uh, for answers to some of those questions. But what I'll do is pivot uh, to local level and a tool that we created called the Greenest Region Compact. And we updated this a couple of years ago, and we did it with a two-phase research project. Um, the first thing that we did is asking the question, well, what are municipalities already doing? With the belief that it's, uh, it's already being done, it's certainly possible, and there are tools and programs to make that happen. And so looking at this, the height of the bar is the number of environmental achievements. We did this through a third party. Um, we looked at basically data sets, uh, didn't really talk to municipalities. And the, the color of the uh, bar is related to the British Region Compact categories. And what we found, so if you look at that um, far right uh, cluster over there, we have high achieving communities. And these are communities that wear their green cards on their sleeves, strongly identify with sustainability, and their constituents demand it. But the real high achievers only make up about 10% of the 290 municipalities that we studied. And what is really exciting um, for us to define how we move forward on this is almost three quarters of our communities are taking actions. They may not realize this is sustainability, they may not identify with it, but they're doing the work. And we have communities, we only have one community out of that study that showed no environmental achievements. And that was fundamental to how we move forward, is, is to bring those programs forward and make them in uh, to the Greatest Region Compact. The next step that we took was to look at kind of building on the leadership of communities that already um, are taking strong sustainable actions and have a sustainability plan. We read them. Um, we analyzed them, and looking at regional and national plans as well, we basically uh, pulled them apart and organized them into sustainability goals. And combining, this is what that looks like, 1,149 sustainability goals analyzed. We spent a lot of time in spreadsheets and data analysis and came up with the beginnings of the framework for the Greenest Region Compact. And because of the way it was created, we call them consensus sustainability goals. And so the final um, Greenest Region Compact organized very high level sustainability goals in these 10 categories that are really tailored for municipalities because this came from what municipalities are doing, how they think, and, and uh, what their goals are. Um, this is the actual compact then, uh, the categories. There's three parts to the Greenest Region Compact. There's the actual compact, which is a pledge to support those goals. Uh, we asked for formal support of that compact through municipal resolution so that there's a community discussion and sometimes that's live and sometimes it sails through. Um, and it's only supporting the goals. There's no reporting uh, required. We do not yet have the ability to track metrics. Um, but all that data that we, we analyzed and all the programs that we looked at, we assembled into the, something called the Greenest Region Compact Framework, which is actually under the table if you want to take a peek at that. And those are optional, it's an optional tool that can help communities focus, um, do a self-assessment, and we'll again hear from our panel a little bit on how they use that. The third part of that program then is collaboration to achieve these goals. And so this is where we work regionally leveraging the membership of the, the Greenest Region Compact to, um, 
to achieve things both for the region and for uh, communities individually. And so this program in particular, uh, this is a, a picture of our Soul Smart Award program. It was the second cohort that we had. Um, and we'll hear more about that um, from our panel as well. But the Soul Smart program just basically provided a pathway for municipalities to streamline codes and policies to invite solar development. And it's been quite successful in some communities, and you get a national designation for it. But we leverage the might of our uh, collaboration. Another um, regional solution that we took was um, of our 128 communities in the Greenest Region Compact, how many full-time sustainability directors do you think we have? Two? That's what I guess. <laughs> Anybody else? It's three that I know of. We're still getting it done. We saw that. But for communities who, you know, who want to accelerate um, and are able to, we got a grant from AmeriCorps. It's a cost-share program where we ask uh, people who are either starting a career in sustainability or want to change careers um, to work full-time service for a year on a cushion with a um, municipality. We're very proud to have Maya Dutta, who's our Greatest Region Board member from Waukegan, uh, joining Mayor Cunningham here today. We have 12 positions. And if you're interested, by the way, my grant is due to AmeriCorps next week, so we can get you in there. And the last of our regional projects that I want to highlight um, kind of goes back to that slide that I had about accelerating and focusing our actions on climate. Um, we have a lot of might with our membership here um, and no sustainability staff, no, not no sustainability staff, but we do not have the ability to do local climate action plans. Um, that's something usually reserved for big cities. We have just a small number of communities that have done it, um, but we've been advocating for and finally uh, we're able to have a dialogue with the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy, which has nearly 10,000 cities around the world that are committed uh, to uh, targeted climate action and to reporting and tracking their greenhouse gas emissions. So they wanted to pilot this program in the U.S. and pick four regions, and we're delighted uh, to be one of those four regions. We just kicked this off a month ago. So that's all that I have on uh, the regional focus and just putting that into context setting. Um, so I'm happy now to turn it over um, to this panel. And I will say that I have the pleasure of working with uh, these elected officials and professionals um, in the work that we do at the Mayor's Caucus. So um, I'm very pleased to introduce my uh, friends and colleagues here. And I will start by a quick introduction. There are our bios are in the program, but Mayor Burns, um, as long as serving mayor in the history of the city of Geneva. He was first elected mayor in 2001, having previously served as alderman on the city council, an appointed member of both the Planning Commission and the Historic Preservation, and a trustee of the Public Library Board. Uh, professionally, Mayor Burns has worked in the not-for-profit sector, having served organizations such as the Muscular Dystrophy Association and the U.S. Olympic Committee. He's currently the director of giving initiatives with Special Olympics Illinois. And that's his, his two day jobs. Um, he still has enough energy um, and passion to give back to the region, and he serves uh, as, a, as kind of a big job, uh, Environment Committee Chairman for the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus. Uh, so in this role, he leads fellow mayors among our membership uh, to advance sustainability issues in the Greatest Region Compact and look for uh, innovative solutions. And then Mayor Kurtz, uh, we next up to uh, Teresa Kurtz, this is the third is in her third term as mayor for the village of Diamond. Uh, she was first elected mayor in 2009 and served also as an appointed street commissioner uh, previous to that. She is past president of the Will County Governmental League, currently serves on the board of directors of the Illinois Municipal League and on the executive board of the Grundy County Economic Development Council. Uh, next will be Mayor Sam Cunningham, who's the 40th mayor of Waukegan and the first African-American mayor elected um, in 2007. He served as first board alderman for 18 years. He was born and raised in Waukegan and earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration and Marketing from Central State University in Ohio and established a successful small insurance business in Waukegan. And Andreana Peterson is the village manager for LaGrange. Previously, she served the villages of Berkeley and Clarendon Hills as well as West Central Municipal Conference. Um, she is a Husky, I'm learning by the color scheme here. Uh, she earned both her bachelor's and master's in public administration right here at NIU, and she's currently an active member of Illinois City County Management Association and in Illinois Employee, in Illinois Public Employee Labor, Labor Relations Association. If I could ask Mayor Burns to 
Hey, folks. Sounds good. Do I need the mucking about, folks? What an extraordinary enthusiastic. <laughs> wow. Well, I am honored to be with this distinguished panel, and I have to share with you a little secret. The three mayors and I were in a panel, and we were told through alternate sources that perhaps we should bring somebody on the panel that really knows what the hell is going on. So our village manager is here because, you know, as mayors, we don't know a whole hell of a lot, at least I know, that's for sure. These two are very talented. Also, by the way, I went to Augustana College, right? We were there in 1986. I majored in political science and Soviet studies. I came to Northern Illinois University to actually pursue a PhD program, which I don't even know if you know this yet, in Soviet studies. I wasn't accepted into the program. Bummer. But three years later, the wall fell, so who cares? <laughs> so I pursued other options. I've been in the not for profit world my whole life. I've lived in Geneva 40, almost 47 years. I have three grown daughters. Your audio doesn't record. Oh my God. <laughs> Should I start over again? Of course not. <laughs> three grown daughters, three grandkids, been there for almost 20 years. Geneva is my home. When Edith talks about the three pillars of the Greenest Region Compact, she, she hit the nail on the head. The reality is this, that while we talk more and more and more about sustainability in my community, there seems to be a higher level of interest in A, what have you done, what are you doing, and what will you do? And that interest comes from primarily two groups of people in Geneva. Those at the elementary, middle school, and high school level, and those who are more politically connected to this environmental substrata of the world. For the majority of my time I spend as mayor, it's usually regarding potholes, leaf pickups, snow removal, what have you. The moment I and others sign the pledge in Chicago, in the North American Climate Summit, the Chicago Climate uh, Commitment Pledge, etc., that's when it became palpable to our community. So we have a, a dedicated webpage to announce and brag about what we're doing. We also have quarterly reports that we share publicly and with our council. And we also have part of our focused strategic plan and, and organizational goals program every year, which we just concluded last week, where those priorities are outlined. Environmental stewardship, of course, is one of the top. In fact, it always has been, but now it's really kind of getting a lot of play, if you will. City of Geneva owns its own utilities. We have, for more than 120 years, owned its own electric utility. We are not a common community. So we operate a little differently, if you will. We derive more than 28% of our current utility demand, electric demand, from renewable sources, yay us. However, we still have a hell of a long way to go, we know that. We derive 10% of our electricity from recapturing methane from a landfill. We have our own natural gas 30 megawatt facility that we provide support to the grid. And we've done all sorts of huge things. We've also done all sorts of smaller things to help get us and move us along this path toward a more sustainable future. Whether you use the word climate action, climate reality, climate change, climate crisis, we prefer in Geneva to use the word sustainability. I believe the way the United Nations defines that is perfect. It's about achieving our goals now, but not hampering those future generations from achieving theirs. We're a small community of about 24,000 people. We believe we're contributing the best we can with the resources we have and the tools we have to achieve a more sustainable future. And I'm delighted to be with you today. I'm looking forward to answering your questions. And I'm certainly honored to be with this panel. So, thank you. Oh yeah, check this out, folks. 120 communities, three counties, 10 councils of government, six million people. We are the largest Volunteer, sustainable, collaborative in the country. So you heard Edith speak earlier about the Global Covenant of Mayors and the International Urban Cooperative Program who are working with us. They selected us because we are the largest organization like this in America. So when I just returned from Las Vegas last week where I got to speak to, ready for this? Building commissioners and code enforcement officers and folks who are in the field and on the ground talking about energy efficiency 
And when they heard that this area of the country, Northern Illinois mostly, is leading the effort with respect to sustainability, they're, they're shocked about that. And when they hear that mayors like us and village administrators and others believe in what we're doing and that we have their back when they are in the field, ensuring that codes are stronger, they're not only proud, they're also honored, and they are still a little bit shocked because you heard it earlier, the yin and yang between economic development and sustainability has always existed, but we believe that it's not mutually exclusive anymore. So with that, back to you. Thank you. I just have to brag a little bit more about that. Um, it was the Illinois Co International Coast Council hearing. The reason that we got involved in that, that Mayor Burns led the Environment Committee to have a discussion on that in March, because that is the U.S. Conference of Mayors has determined that's the most impactful thing that uh, local governments can do related to climate change. It doesn't cost anything. And we'll, uh, those of you who have seen some British Region Compact communities in the audience, we'll be in touch with you about sort of engaging on that voting process for uh, uh, modern energy codes. And by the way, Mayor Burns apparently brought down the house uh, a room full of, literally, a room full of codes uh, officials from around the country uh, applauded the mayor's comments the first time a mayor has uh, testified um, at that. Uh, at and that just to be clear, they applauded when I left. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so next, I'd like to introduce Mayor Terry Kearns from Diamond. I think you'll be making your comments from there. Um, and just so you know, uh, as you follow along with the slides, we've got the profile here of, of each community, and then we'll, uh, report, uh, we'll have an opportunity. We'll just try to follow along with redistribution compact categories for the work they've done. Thank you, Edith. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Terry Kearns, Mayor for the Village of Diamond. We have 2,500 residents. So am I the smallest municipality here today, or is there anyone in the audience with a smaller community? I thought so. Wait. Okay. One of the things we've recently done is become a member of the Kankakee River Valley Water Planning Area Alliance. I think that of all the things the municipality does, providing safe, economical, reliable, and sustainable water is the most important. Because if you can't do that, everything else is irrelevant. You have to keep in mind, Diamond has eight employees. And a lot of people think because you come from a small community, you don't have a lot of work. We do everything that my fellow mayors do, but we do it with eight employees and a very small budget. So the purpose for the Kankakee River Valley uh, doing this water, uh, it probably will end up being a co-op, is currently we have three wells. It's very expensive to treat our water. You have to pull radium out of it. The aquifers can be very questionable. I can tell you as a mayor, when two of your three wells are down and you're pumping water out of one well 24 seven, worried about running out of water, you don't sleep at night. So one of our neighbors recently had several structure fires where they actually ran out of water and they were pumping our water to fight the fire in their town. And we were happy to give our water, uh, but you really can't run a municipality like that. So the groups that you'll see on the map there have joined forces, and currently we do in fact have a permit to pull water from the Kankakee River, and we are engineering the structure to remove the water to pull the water from the river. You have to keep in mind, aquifers when you, when you have a well, you're depleting the aquifer, plus you're removing radium and you have to get rid of that some way. When you pull river water, your people use the water, then you treat the water at your waste water treatment plant, and most of that water goes back into the basin. So it is a very sustainable uh, way of supplying water. On my next slide, I don't know if any of you are familiar, but in 2013, Diamond uh, was impacted by the tornado that also hit Washington. 2,500 of our homes were um, damaged or destroyed. We had joined IPWMAN, 
Illinois Public Works Mutual Aid Network shortly before that. I'm sure you're aware that police has ILEAS for mutual aid, FIRE has MAVIS for mutual aid, and now finally Public Works has IPLAMAN for mutual aid. It was wonderful to put out the call to them and then the next morning have 20 dump trucks show up free of charge to remove debris from our community. So if you aren't a member, it costs us $100 a year. It's definitely money well spent. And my final slide, um, we did a safe routes to school several years before this. I had applied and not been chosen several times. And when I finally partnered with our two neighboring communities in the school district, we were successful. Uh, we had a travel plan. And one of the things missing from our travel plan was this multi-use bike path. So we um, partnered with the property owner. He gave us the property for the bike path. And then we piggybacked three grants. The ICAP grant, the ComEd Green Region Open Lands grant, and a Three Rivers Realtors grant, along with our local match. So for Diamond, uh, without partnerships, we would be very um, hard pressed to do all the things that we do. We've actually utilized partnerships to mac maximize uh, what we do in Diamond. <laughs> Thank you. very much. Uh, you know, I was sitting here listening to the two mayors and I'm like, wow, uh, one, I wish I had me a uh, uh, energy plan if I could take that much. Um, and I would certainly appreciate the fact that when the mayor said that what we employees do, what we have many that you do with aid, you to be committed, your staff to be committed. What an awesome job. Give it up for our young. I'm going to, as well, stay seated. Uh, there's some things that uh, Maya and staff have written for me, but I'm first going to give you a little history about the city of Waukegan. The city of Waukegan is uh, the largest community north of Lake Cook Road. We are the ninth largest city in the state of Illinois. If you take Lake Cook Road and go north all the way to Route 12, we are the largest community on that. Coupled with, we are the most diverse community on that northern part of the state of Illinois. Um, you know, we have uh, been able to also adopt the, you know, the, the, the GRC uh, back in 2018, signed on to the climate uh, chart back in 2017. But, you know, our, our, our history is this. Back in 1992, uh, the city of Waukee was deemed to have the world's uh, largest PCB, PCB uh, and, it's, and I'm quoting, mess in the world. The largest in a small city that then was uh, produced by what we call OMC. OMC is Outdoor Marine Corporation. Just to bring it to full uh, measure. You might remember Johnson, the word Johnson on the boat motors? But those boat motors were made in Waukegan, Illinois. The company went belly up around 2000, early part of 2000. And when they left, they left a just uh, PCBs throughout that whole channel. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency came in over the last 30 years, they've spent probably 150, maybe 200 million dollars to clean up our harbor. And our harbor is a refuge harbor. That means all the stressed folks that are out there, they need some help, then they can come to the Waukegan Harbor and then get what is necessary so they can go back home. At one point in time, they were looking for the cities, local municipalities, to do that. The unfortunate part for us, uh, back in those 92, the things were very, going very, very well for the city of Waukee. We had roughly 20,000 jobs in our community. And at that time, those were middle class jobs. Well, when they left, 
we did not have a strategy. I call it a transition strategy. So our middle class left the city of Milwaukee. So today, uh, you know, fast forward 30 years later, we have said, what do we want us to be? What is the face of the city of Waukegan needs to be over the next you know, 20, 50, 20 to 40 years? We're gonna do the same thing a lot of communities have done on their lakefront. And mind you, our beach area, our beach area is the largest beach area on that Lake Michigan line. We have three linear miles of beach. Combine all of Chicago, our beach area, we have much, a much larger region than the city of Chicago. Outside of Chicago, going north, our beach is larger than all of those cities combined. I said when I took office, how can we make this more accessible to people outside of Waukee? My vision, and this is the vision that I have there, and I tell you how we're going to get there. I want to become the Northern Navy Pier in Lake County with our beach, utilizing tourism. And more importantly, how do we start doing it? We did an assessment on our community, and that assessment came to be $550 million to bring us up to par. We started our CIP, we started bonding, infrastructure. That's how you get it started. We started working on all of our roads, our streets, our sidewalks our bridges, now to our beach, more activities that have gone down at the beach here. And we believe if we continue on that road, that we will be that community that can now be sustainable. And then we will be that community to look as examples of how not only to be prepared in the event that something happens, but have a strategy that can go beyond 10 or 20 years. So we're excited about where we're at and where we're going and the measure we're doing it. And compounding, while we might not have an energy, we do have a water plant. We are looking to, be, to supply water to our western part of our county through the city of Waukee. $12 million that we're investing as we speak today in our plants. And I, we think that is how we can now start moving the sustainability goal and be a part of this climate change throughout the northern part of the state of Illinois. Thank you. Programs, 
throughout all levels of our organization. And as Edith mentioned earlier, while we were executing more and more of these initiatives, we were not always great at quantifying or communicating those successes to the public. So approximately 10 years ago, the Village Board developed a list of green initiatives in five categories, vehicles, building and infrastructure, services and operations, community development and zoning, and event promotion and education. This information is now included on our website and is a, a big part of a lot of our communications um, uh, that we give out related to green initiatives. The list helps us to track those initiatives, serves as a tool to help us plan for those initiatives, and also provides this mechanism for communication. And I included the link in case anyone would like to look at it. Um, so part of this planning also includes our annual budgeting process. We have a five-year planning budget, and on the budget document itself, we denote initiatives within an, that have an environmental component with a green dot. Not super sophisticated, but a very good communication tool. And surprisingly, there's you know a lot more information. You know, as Edith was mentioning earlier, there's a lot of things that we're doing that we just didn't really realize were environmentally focused. Grants uh, is also um, on my list of things of how to integrate uh, this type of activity into your uh, operations. Um, in the green, each department is charged with identifying and applying for grants related to sustainability initiatives, which helps to leverage our increasingly limited budget and capital dollars. In the past um, several years, the village has been fortunate to receive almost $4 million in grants that we have used for sustainable and related initiatives. We also have an active environmental quality commission and citizen volunteers you know, should not be discounted. Um, the commission helps to further our sustainable culture by monitoring current initiatives and supporting new initiatives like the Greenest Region Compact and Soul Smart, to name a few. Finally, we also use social media and the website to promote special events, as I'm sure many of you do. Uh, for example, in the last two months, we partnered with a neighboring community to host a pumpkin smash composting event, native plant bicycle tour, recycling education center at our West End Arts Festival, and we're soon beginning a holiday light recycling initiative. We also partner with a number of organizations on environmental programs, such as our LaGrange Business Association, which is very active, Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, Active Transportation Alliance, West Cook County Solid Waste Agency, the Mayor's Caucus, of course, and Cook County to further these sustainability goals. So a few projects uh, to highlight um, that may not have been specifically touched on yet by uh, my fellow mayors here. Uh, energy efficiency initiatives, so as one example, our village hall, um, this village hall was built in 1899. It's on the National Register for Historic Places, and when we needed to update the interior, including the mechanicals and the lighting, we had to modernize the building in a historically sensitive way while still considering green opportunities. This was difficult to do. We have a historic society, um, and we had resident groups that were concerned that you know, um, there was going to be a choice between going green and, uh, you know, uh, putting together a, a plan that was going to also be historically sensitive, but we were, we were able to make that work. Um, we received almost uh, half a million dollars in energy efficiency grants from Cook County, which supplemented our available budget dollars and allowed us to do more with less, including energy efficient lighting, energy efficient HVAC systems, and um, more programmable systems, given that we had, I think, six or eight different types of HVAC units uh, in that historic building. Um, we also provided similar upgrades in our police department. Safe drink drinking water is also a hot topic um, in, the er in an area where the village has also been proactive. In 2013, the village replaced all of its water meters with new meters in residential homes. And as a part of that project, we recorded all of the private service lines that were going into the house. So whether they were lead, copper, or iron. And out of about 5,000 households in the range, uh, 1,300 of those had lead service lines, um, which was actually less than we expected given the age of our community. But I think over time, some of those service lines have been replaced. 
So as more and more concerns regarding lead became prevalent in the news, we knew that we needed to come up with a way to address that situation because the actual cost, if we were to replace all of those lead service lines ourselves, would be $6.5 million. Um, so we were one of the first communities to implement a program which provides an option for residents to replace their lead service lines at a discounted cost that the village jointly bids for in conjunction with larger roadway and water main projects in front of their homes. So about 70% of eligible residents have participated in the program over the last two years. So we're moving in the right direction. It's not perfect, but it's definitely trying to get us on the right track. Project development and implementation. Um, just one example of that, the village recently renovated one of its train stations. This is our historic train station built in 1901. And careful consideration went into the design of that structure, just like I was mentioning about the village hall. Well, we were able to source a 100% recyclable polymeric roofing material that mimicked the look of the original slate roof, as well as a number of other materials that provide lower maintenance and recyclable components. Uh, lighting was also designed to match 1901 fixtures, but with the modern efficiency that we need. And as the station has one of the highest ratios of commuters biking and walking to it on the metro line, walkability and accessibility to the station was integrated seamlessly into that design. Bicycle, park, bicycle parking was increased significantly. Um, and we also added public bicycle tour, or tools for repairs and air pump for any flat tires to try to subsidize more usage. And this over $3 million project was 100% grant funded through numerous grant sources. Stormwater management, uh, like most communities, stormwater management has become an even, even bigger priority as the frequency and intensity of rain events has increased. The village has committed to replacing its commuter and visitor parking lots with permeable paver systems, which help reduce stormwater runoff and erosion. The village has received over $650,000 in grants towards these projects in the last few years. This year, uh, which is what that photo is, <clears throat> the village received a sustainable landscaping award from the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District for incorporating green sustainable landscaping into the recent permeable parking lot designs. So thank you again for the opportunity to be here today, and obviously I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. You know, uh, as and I can, I'm gonna take myself. You know, I, I grew up in um, on the southeast side of uh, town, uh, low income area, and a lot of times what's on people's minds is just day to day, trying to just get through. Um, I think it is comes upon our leadership, of local government, and I, I really want to me in this this lead day is going which is a huge problem about this country. And then put down to the, the lower level. She does a fantastic job of initiating that. But from a standpoint of um, who needs to take charge, it has to start with us local leaders. Uh, and the reason it has to start with us, because uh, I'm looking at my demographics, they just don't understand the importance of it. And sometimes we as leaders don't understand unless we get out and become a part of you know, the, the, the GRC, kind of mayors, understanding what that's out there so that we can take this information back 
to our communities, put a strategy in place, and then, by, you know, sometimes government is sit on the shelf, execute. And then as questions arise out of why are we doing this, we can explain to our residents the importance of having this part of our community. And that importance really comes back to this. And I call this thing called stay in your lane. The stay in your lane mode is we are good at police, fire, public works, city service, water, energy. We're good at those things. Outside of that, you know, we need help, so we need to partner. That's why having these, these partnerships are so critical to the success of our community. That then leads to who's going to live in our communities. People are going to live in our communities and have good schools, have an awesome, um, I, I would say, city government that gives that police, fire, public works, and service, war, etc. And if we don't have those, then you're not going to get that middle class and upper middle class families, and for those families who are struggling, how they can then look at that vast majority of the population where they can strive to be. That's why it's so important that we attend you know, sessions like this, go out to Vegas and listen to what our uh, other communities are doing so we can bring that information back and then have our residents start asking those questions. Why, why, why? And then we can give those 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 uh, those plans that are sustainable to make sure that our communities are going to be around for our grandchildren, great grand, etc. Hope that answers your question. Perfect. Thank you, Mayor Hurts. Yeah. I agree with what you said. I also think that as a municipal leader, we have to nudge our residents in the right direction. Uh, sometimes I don't think they actually know we're nudging them, but we do nudge them. But for me, I'm fortunate with Edith and the Mayor's Caucus and all of the groups that we participate with to see the great things that they're doing and then steal their ideas. Yeah. I was a policeman for 22 years in Bolingbrook, and we don't reinvent the wheel, we steal it. And I do that with my municipality. If someone has a good idea, if it's regarding sustainability, or how to change out lead pipes what or service lines, um, we do pay close attention. So uh, that's what we do in partnerships, as I said before. When we get grants for STP for a million dollars, we didn't have the local match. So we look around for the stakeholders. Who is this going to benefit? We bring them all to the table. And we've actually been able to get local matches from property owners and developers that have enabled us to go for large grants that otherwise we would not be able to do simply because we didn't have the local match. So you have to get creative, you have to create partnerships, and you have to try everything and think outside the box. I think in LaGrange, our, our problem is probably more that residents want us to do more than we're doing now. Um, and uh, of course, we want to try to achieve that objective, but it's all about balance. And I mentioned earlier about the finite resources. Um, we, you know, we, I think we struggle to balance the uh, demands of some of our constituents or a lot of our constituents with our ability to uh, provide all the essential services we have to provide. So I couldn't agree more uh, with the mayors that you know the partnerships are really essential to the success of a lot of these initiatives. And without those partnerships um, and extensions of our staff and the ability to apply for grants, we we just could not achieve these things. So I think you know advocacy for more grant programs because I think residents are going to demand more. And although I couldn't agree more that you know we're good at certain things, I think residents are demanding more and more that we also be good at this and and uh, you know really make our mark. Um, uh, you know the the younger generation is demanding it as well. 
I echo everything that's been said. Uh, let me just give you a perfect example of what occurred and what is occurring in Geneva. We live along the Fox River. We are 184 years old this year. Our claim to fame is primarily in 1873. When the Chicago fire occurred two years earlier, Geneva built a hotel to help house those who were displaced from the Chicago fire. That hotel is no longer there. The community's changed. We grew up on the train track. Thank God for the Union Pacific. Life is good. We have a two and a half year waiting list to get a parking spot to take the train to Chicago. Two and a half years. So mobility is a huge issue. We've never appreciated how valuable a train was to our community, nor did we ever appreciate how valuable the river was to our community. 20 years ago, you would not swim in the Fox River. But now, of course, it's swimmable, and it's got recreation. Our friends to the north in Elgin and our friends to the south in Aurora use the Fox River for their water. We do not. We have a reverse osmosis system. We use deep and shallow aquifers, etc. But if we needed to, we could draw from the Fox River. So now we understand that what we do in Geneva affects everybody downstream, and what our friends do up north affects everybody downstream as well. We've suddenly grown up to realize that we're not in this alone. And when you look at the demographics of our community, those who are aging, me included, we look back 15, 20 years ago and shriek and think, what the hell were we thinking? And those who are now new to our community say, we're going to keep you accountable. We have a Natural Resources Commission in Geneva, made up of volunteers, who raise money and implement programs throughout the community. It is chartered by the city of Geneva. They plant, through their fundraising efforts, 300 trees a year. They've literally replaced the entire front lawn of City Hall with native vegetation. They have taken six, I believe, of our uh, dry basin water areas and planted native vegetation in those at the fire stations, the police stations, what have you. So they're doing all sorts of projects that they can then bring people out and say, that is what sustainability looks like. Here's an example of nudging your community. In our water treatment facility, we do the entire parking lot in permeable papers. And the calls rolled in. Why the hell are you spending so much money just to make that place look good? We failed to provide the information as to why that was a better investment than just dash home. Now it seems like you do everything in permeable papers. But nevertheless, it's, it's, it's a step forward, and I believe, Ethan has heard me say this before, we are screwing ourselves if we believe perfection is the goal. Right now, progress is the goal. And if we can share that progress with our citizens, I believe they'll jump on board as well. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and Mayor Burns, you answered my next question, so you don't have to answer this one. But oh, I'm good. Really good. <laughs> no, <laughs> stay here. Um, but, but what I wanted to ask, and some of you have touched on this, is what is the role of citizen engagement? How do you engage or should you engage businesses and the citizens? And do you do that formally and formally? If you can talk, and I'll just kind of open it up to anyone who wants to comment on that. Citizen and business engagement. I, I, I'm a firm believer. Firm believer of ownership. You know, um, as mayors uh, and, and and obviously the, the business manager uh, is the mayor. If we don't get our department heads to own some of the goals and objectives that we that we've laid out, then you as mayor will be in those departments trying to run those departments all the time. You know, uh, when I first became mayor, it's a true story. I first became mayor. The first week. I walk around, shake hands, say, hey, you know, and everyone knew me. I'm 18 years been on the board, but they didn't know me from a management standpoint. So I get back to my desk, and there's a stack of papers in my office for my signature. I'm like, what, what, what is this all about? And it was bills, actual bills. I, the mayor had to sign off on all of these invoices. And I come from corporate America, Enterprise Rent a Car, Austin Insurance, Operations, I'm like, why am I signing off on these bills? Well, the mayor signs off on everything. It blew my mind. I said, no wonder these guys are crazy. <laughs> I then came to the department head and I said, listen, here's a bill, here's a bill. I don't know what this is for. 
You need to run your business unit. Now, if you can't run it, then I'll find someone who can. From that day forward, I haven't had anything signed, except, you know, the stuff we had approved and contracts, whatever have you. But how do we get them engaged? We have to give our citizens ownership of some of these processes. Transparency, awesome. Get out there. We're going through a update our comprehensive plan. The first thing I said to them, let the community tell you what they want. Not a firm belief in this. The customer is always right. No. Those in business are running our, 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 our cities. You know, it's not necessarily true, but the fact is they think they're always right. Let them believe that. They're okay. Until we allow, give them some ownership of some of these processes, some of the ideas that we have to move forward, it's going to be extremely difficult for us to push those things down. I'm going to go back to when you said you were at, uh, in Vegas talking to building commissioners. We were able to uh, move in a direction of changing our ordinances so it, it allows solar. Lo and behold, 50, about a third of the businesses in the city of Waukegan started saying, it's about time. I then instituted, the mayor will start going out to what's called site meetings. I knock on doors to all the businesses and tell them, hey, I'm the mayor, you're my customer, how can I help? Then they started coming with all these ideas, and to your point, they're right. They do want, they're demanding a lot of things, but sometimes they're demanding because they don't know what we have to offer. And I do not sell anything but service. I sell service of the city of Waukegan, and I think we do it, I think we do it very, very well. But to your point of the, the original question, we must engage the public as best as we can, whether it be at open meetings, at council meetings, calling back, whatever have you. And I think the more we allow them to take ownership of that block, Here's a prime example of taking notice of the block. Neighborhood watch groups. They're increased by 50% because neighborhood police are going out and says, hey, we want to know which car is not should belong on the block. Give us a call. So it's expanding. And that is the, the small way of saying people really want to know what's going on and they really want to help. They just don't know how. And we as government have always said, no, that's not yours, that's ours, leave it to us. I'm, I'm the opposite. Because when people take ownership of it, it's less work for us and we can concentrate on things like this. Being in front of you, telling us our strategies. Telling you our strategies. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. So we're, we're running a little bit out of time, so you have, you have comments on uh, the community engagement, business engagement? Yeah? I'll make it very quick. Okay. Uh, I wish I had that problem. We rarely have anyone come to a board meeting, and I've gotten so bad that when I do get someone who comes and asks a lot of questions, I ask if they'd like to be on a board, yeah. and then they never come back. So um, I stress to my staff that it's, you know, we are there for our residents and for our businesses. So we sell good service to our, to our people, and I think that is what sets us apart. Um, but in an effort to communicate with our residents and our business owners, we started Smart Message, which we send out messages via their cell phones, their emails. Because a lot of times we vote on things and we assume we're doing what they want us to do. We don't have a clue. So uh, that does motivate them to call and let us know if we're going in the right direction or not. But I tried to ins institute um, community watch program. I could not get my people involved. Apparently most of them, both mom and dad, work. And I just have been um, unable to do it. We did CERT training, trying to get a CERT group together for emergency response. We trained them, but then couldn't keep them. So if anyone has the answer, please send it my way. Well, that was an informative perspective. Thank you for that. Um, if I can pivot, there are two more points that I wanted to get out. Um, and to Mayor Cunningham's stay in your lane uh, point, 
the perception is that you know that sustainability initiatives require investment. We just don't have the money to do that. Um, but if I could, uh, Mayor uh, Cunningham mentioned the Solar Work program, but I wonder if I could call on um, Andre to talk a little bit about the initiative um, on Soul Smart, which is also what Mayor uh, Joaquin was was uh, benefiting from. Uh, sure, SoulSmart. We um, instituted or uh, uh, became a part of the SoulSmart process this year through the Mayor's Caucus. It was uh, a very good process. Again, uh, the theme is partnerships, and that certainly is a partnership that uh, has been very valuable with the Mayor's Caucus in bringing these initiatives to us. Uh, we dedicated a staff person, uh, not completely, but we had to dedicate a staff person, our planner, uh, to the process, and uh, there were several different categories that we needed to evaluate, primarily related to our building. You mentioned uh, building permits and, and building codes. Uh, reviewing that, we had to review our permit procedures. Um, you know, we don't have a tremendous amount of people that are requesting building permits for solar. I think we had something like seven or eight permits in the last four years. Um, but you know the idea behind the program is to try to incentivize and, and really just bring more interest to the the uh, the, the solar option. Uh, recently, actually, at our last village board meeting, the village board decided to discount building permit fees related to solar installations. So now um, it's even more cost effective for people to go solar. Uh, and we've also been advertising the program. Um, and, and the fact that the village was named a bronze, we're a bronze uh, uh, category member at this point. Um, we have a very old building code that needs to be updated. <laughs> um, and I'll just add on to that a little bit. So the idea, you know, the, the investment in what it took uh, to earn that Soul Smart. Um, th there are some communities that we have in the Soul Smart cohort. Yes, it was staff time. You had to do your homework on that. But there really was no expenditures of funds um, in the village of Schaumburg. They had three solar permits in the village before earning the SoulSmart designation, and about 16 months later, they had 103. Um, we've had some communities, the village of Hanover Park has tracked uh, $500,000 worth of investment in solar from the private sector in their community um, since earning SoulSmart. Uh, so, kind of along the in your lane, if I could um, give you the pun, Mayor Burns, if you would talk us about <laughs> your. Um, pavement procurement policies, because that's a sensible small win um, that we work together on in, in this kind of meeting. Edith and I attended a meeting at the Illinois Tollway Association not long ago, and learned about this fascinating product called Warm Mixed Asphalt. Who's heard of that? Nobody. Warm Mixed Asphalt produces less carbon dioxide, uses less energy, has just as long staying power, and only costs a few percentage points more in terms of acquisition. So the city of Geneva, through my extraordinary leadership and having no idea what the hell I was doing, suggested to our Department of Public Works Director, Mr. Babica, who was president of this meeting, why don't we, in our 2019 street program, which we invest about two, two and a half million dollars to repave streets as needed, use warm mixed asphalt instead. We put the bids out, we chose the provider, they agreed to the warm mixed asphalt, they put it before the council for a vote. It was slightly more expensive than the previous year, and when it was explained, it was like, oh, this makes sense. It was as simple as that, it was amazing. So now, rest assured, every time we go out for a bid, which is of course every year, to the tune of about two to two and a half million dollars to redo our roads, It'll be a warm, mixed asphalt product. And we, we brag about that because it's a simple solution, but then we also push out that information to our citizens who say, okay, you're continuing down this path. Thank you very much. It's really pretty cool. And uh, kind of in that stay in your lane, a little bit outside of your lane, Mayor Cunningham, if I can share the story on your behalf, mm -hmm. the actions that municipalities of any size, I mean, how many municipalities have been by asphalt? Thought it was everybody. Yeah, okay, we'll hire the hands, right? So this is a simple strategy, and the reduction 
um, uh, 71 tons of CO2 annually from the use of more mixed asphalt. And kind of to the outside of your lane issue is in Waukegan, you have a coal-fired power plant, I believe. Yes. Right? And you have some activists uh, asking you to shut that down. And is that in your authority to shut that down? No. <laughs> That's not enough. So um, thank you for that, that commentary about uh, staying in your lane. We have just a few minutes to see if there's any questions that you want to ask of our panel or me. I have a question about the use of um, single-use plastics, you know, that just kind of the idea of holding big events in your villages or cities, and how you handle that, you know, the habits of convenience, um, how you move away from that, because I know there's a larger, sometimes larger expense to that, but I just wonder if any of you have had improvements in that area, because I think it's just such a huge and important part of sustainability. No, I, 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 that's kind of out of my, uh, that is out of my lane a little bit, and just not familiar with it. Uh, we, we contract with, um, oh goodness, what is it? The, 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 it's not the old no more. Advance. We, we contract with Advance, and part of that contract is to separate all of the of the plastics in uh, all, all the recyclables here. But I will say this to you about all of the plastics. Uh, with our relationship now with China, a lot of our communities are going to be seriously struggling with what is really uh, considered recyclables and what type of plastics are being uh, going to be used and not used. Uh, and that's something that cost is probably going to be hitting our tables in about another year, year and a half, if not two. So you might be having a different conversation uh, with this in another two years. Uh, that's, that's going through the U.S. Conference of Mayors that came out, and, and they're pretty strong on it. They're just not taking the certain things they used to take. And, and some of our uh, refuse companies used to get compensated for some of this, and they're not being offered. So those costs are going to be coming back. They just need to identify what is good plastic and what is bad plastic. No plastic is good plastic. <laughs> That's really essentially what they say, but I don't know. not realistic. I can speak on this a little bit. So uh, in LaGrange, we have a very strong partnership with our business association. Um, we actually have a, we have a, we're part of a regional chamber, but we also have a separate business association. And that business association handles a lot of our special events. So, um, as I was mentioning earlier, we just recently had this West End Art Festival was one of the events. And as a part of that, we worked with that business association to make sure that all of the vendors that were involved in that event were using sustainable products. So, um, using recyclable plates and compostable utensils, um, using glass instead of plastic. Um, you know, it's certainly a work in progress and there's always, there always could be uh, improvements, but uh, that was a wine event, so we had cork recycling um, and you know anything else that, that our environmental commission could kind of come up with that could be recycled. We worked with the businesses to do, and, and that's really key, I think, in those in those um, events is is a part of the planning, and we start the planning on these as I'm sure most municipalities do, you know, a year in advance. Is that you start to telegraph this, you know, to the participants. And just that's just the way, you know, kind of this is the way that we're going to run the event. And everyone, everyone I think is along for it. And it, it's a great way also to promote to the public that this is not only a great event, but it's also a sustainable event. So another plus. Thank you. Um, one more quick question before we wrap up the panel. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I work for an investment company and major asset manager, and we've been tasked in the respond team to come up with sustainable investing, impact investing, and what we're looking for is metrics and, and the standardized and quantitative stuff. Where are you guys at in that process? 
Is it okay if I answer that? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because you talk, sure. about, talk about funding or something like that. Right. I think if you had standardized you know, metrics and everything that's out there, it'd be easier for it to be, be financing. It's getting managed in Europe yeah. and everywhere. Well, we would love to. We would love to. I'll work through an unfair version of this uh, too in a minute. But I just wanted to say, so the uh, the British Region Compact was put together. The Marriage Act Caucus is actually very tiny. We put that document together um, and put it out there for adoption, but did not have the ability to put uh, tracking and metrics in it. We were also, you know, advised not to tell municipalities what to do. We didn't prioritize anything on that. We're now almost three years old, and with 128 communities. We've had more conversations about how about some tracking metrics. Um, and Mayor Burns, who were part of that, uh, we had a, a task force to look at what would be helpful to municipalities. And there was a strong interest in being able to con uh, convey and telegraph to your residents what you're doing and what does that mean in terms of metrics. So the, uh, we've had that need for a while out there. Um, and then the opportunity with this regional climate plan Frustratingly, while it's a great honor to be chosen with this, we're still doing fundraising on it. Um, but the, the hope is that we're able to align the strategies of the Greenest Region Compact. What can municipalities do? We know whether they're doing energy conservation, they're uh, improving their water uh, systems, their water for utilities, we're buying more mixed asphalt, you know, all the actions that we're doing, how does that connect up to regional greenhouse gas targets? And so we have an intention of, of building that up as part of this, um, because it's really important for, um, for uh, the, a regional climate plan to be able to report progress um, towards your targets. You need to set a target report in progress towards your targets. It's a challenging thing to do, particularly at a regional level. But when we do activities like SoulSmart, which was very impactful for communities, um, we don't actually have the ability right now to say how many installations you know, can you have in, Jared, anything in Montgomery? How many installations do you have? 91 this year. Okay, so that's how we do it pretty much, is you know, how many installations have you had in your community, and we know we can do better. Because we, you know, if we can track the kilowatt capacity, we can track the greenhouse gas emissions. So with support, we can do that. We think we have the framework and the demand for it. Do you want to add anything? We are always welcoming investment. <laughs> we would love to talk to you about how your wealth management group could partner with us to not only add some sophistication to our measurement tools, but to move forward in that regard as well. So, adding less than a million bucks. Well, yeah, we managed to see those as a I like this one. <laughs> <laughs> May I ask you what company it is? Uh, in Pitbull. Of course. Yeah, I know exactly where you are. Yeah, that's cool. And keep in mind, you know, when, when we talk about clean energy, we talk about clean this, we're also looking for folks who believe in clean investment. So partnership with you would be fantastic and everybody. So. When, when we first started this conversation about climate, um, and I have to say that starting with the Mayor's Caucus, we're a large, diverse organization. Every municipality is um, uh, uh, invited to be a member of it, and not everyone was wholly supportive of the conversation on climate change when we started this conversation. Um, we don't get any pushback right now. Not everybody wants to come along. But the, the primary conversation that I've had with municipalities is we don't do anything on climate. And I'll admit, when I started the Greatest Region Compact, I said, we really, I don't think we can tackle that either. But I have realized that we are doing that. It's the idea we're doing environmental programs, we're doing sustainability programs, we're really doing climate programs. So it's, it's kind of focusing and accelerating. So it's certainly something that we can do. Um, and, you know, globally speaking, this global covenant of mayors, all these climate mayors, North American Climate Summit, there's an increasing focus on the ability of local governments to get it done, particularly with the paralysis that we have, the fear that we have um, of taking climate action at the federal level. So I think with that, um, it's time for me to wrap up, and I am very, very grateful for your participation in this panel and extraordinarily grateful for um, my winning panel here. I'm very proud of uh, Mayor Sam Cunningham, Mayor Terry Kearns, I'm Rihanna Peterson, and Mayor Kevin Burns. So please join me in thanking them.